Hello, uh, I am off center. Sorry, I was just talking to Ben behind the scenes. Hello, all, welcome back to the. Oh, yeah. Hello, all, welcome back to the Rockwood Academy. Uh, today's session, we are taking a look at Teleport 9, which has just been released. You may have seen the release announcement yesterday, two days ago. Yesterday, yeah, yesterday, uh, with some awesome new features. So we thought we would jump onto a session and uh, take a look at the new features and also do a bit of a Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to get involved, drop them into the comments and we'll tackle them. Well, I won't tackle them, I'll do my best, but we are joined today, fortunately, by Ben Arnott. Hey man, how's it going? It's good. Thanks for having me, David. I'm <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm going to be tweaking my position, trying to make sure that I'm, I'm centered. But... I know. Uh, so thank you for joining us again. This is not our, our first stream together. We always have a lot of fun playing with Teleport together, and I'm sure today will be no exception. Um, for the people that have not seen you before on the live stream here, can you just tell us a little bit about Ben? Yeah, um, my name is Ben Arendt. I'm a de developer relations manager at Teleport, and I've been in the developer tool space, I think almost like a decade now in various roles. <laughs> Um, spanning UX product and developer relations. And so um, I sort of touched everything. I also ran a Redis as a service product. And so oh. I'm pretty excited about our Redis uh, support <laughs> since um, when we had Redis to go, many people would find their passwords in GitHub. And Ooh. so, <laughs> which is a common thing. No, there's nothing too bad in uh, your Redis database, but it's not something you want to expose. And so, yeah, I'm excited to demo Teleport 9, our machine ID, and the long tail of other things that we've added. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. It feels like there's just a new release of Teleport every other week. And of course, there's not a new release every other week. But for a company and a team, these are moving really, really fast. It's just so exciting to see all these new features coming along. Uh, I think I've completely just bought into the Teleport ethos now, and I just use it constantly and uh, the fact that we're getting new features on a regular is just great now so that i don't mess it up what is the official release cadence do you have one or is it just when something's cool is built we're going to ship it no i think we've moved to a three month release cycle three months. and we also made our roadmap public and so you can go to our docs and see what our roadmap is for the next three months we also changed our semantic versioning um last year to sort of represent more breaking changes between the different versions and version compatibility yeah. there was sort of an, a time in which we wouldn't necessarily like we would ship lots of features but we wouldn't change the version or our version wasn't very clear um so another thing since we're like an open core company we have a um, request for discussion and so you can go to our git repo and sort of understand like what our ver like versioning strategy is and then also look at our roadmap um and the one feedback we've got is like it's great that you're releasing all these features, but upgrades can be difficult, especially for like our large customers. And that is something that is going to be added in, uh, I believe Teleport 10, maybe 11, but there's a team actively working on sort of automatic upgrades, um, which is an interesting, you know, computer science problem in itself. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think I've been using Teleport and Clustered now for like 18 months. In fact, starting with Teleport 5 and we're now at Teleport 9. And it's always auto-installed, the latest version, but at no point has it ever broken my automation. Like we always just seem to get a new version of Teleport and it just works. Like, I mean, have there even That's been good. backwards compatibility breaks and I've just been very lucky or like? Uh, I think it's mostly some of our customers who may be on four or five. All right, okay. um, <laughs> you know, also because we have a whole, uh, you know, large suite of customers from like open source community to sort of like Fortune 500s, you know, we've, still supports uh like we supported CentOS 6 longer than CentOS 6 was sort of supported by red hat and so we generally try to like meet our customers where they are and you might see sometimes in our releases we do do um back patches to i think you're going back to like six for both yeah. performance and security and you can see that in our like semantic versioning we describe like at what point will we like not backport security fixes? But if it's a bad one, we will sort of go about our way to backport one. I think we backported a fix into like four dot something recently. Um, so we try and support all of our customers as much as we can. That's awesome. Cool. All right. Well, we're here today to talk about the latest release, Teleport 9, which dropped yesterday. 
do you want to give us the the highlights of the release and then we can dig into a few of them um i can pop the yeah. blog up if you want to start on machine id or do you want to start it was just a high level no let's start on machine yeah. id okay go for it. so machine id is a new addition <laughs> to teleport nine and we sort of describe the problem in this blog post but you know up until teleport not like teleport nine it, teleport was mainly focused on sort of humans accessing infrastructure and being really good at that but we would have people who would set up all of their infrastructure with teleport you know maybe not even have like open ssh and then we want to also use the same short-lived certificates for like ansible runs for jenkins basically everything that also has some form of like ssh certificates to some degree and you could do this with teleport you could do like tcuddle auth export um assert for a short period of time but people would just end out making these like five-year <laughs> ssh certificates which is basically the same as like a public private key to some degree yep. and you know in teleport we have a ca rotation that you can run so if you did a ca rotation that long list certificate would break and then all of that like other work that people like when we had teams can like build this in house and so machine id is a sort of a new addition to sort of teleport that makes it very easy for you to issue sort of certificates and identity for machines and sort of provide that same tooling for like infrastructure tools i imagine for people that were doing this prior to machine id especially when they're using one of the you know open id or saml backends and not local users which I assume it's probably a large majority of teleport customers, but they would probably have to break out to local users for machine. Is that a fair assumption? They could. We also added um, impersonation. And so you could create a, like a non-login user um, that you could impersonate. And that was sort of our recommended approach to this. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, some people would create like a local user because you ultimately don't want someone to be able to like physically log in as the Jenkins bot. <laughs> true that makes a lot of sense so machine id is is going to solve this challenge for people that want to be able to give their ci systems access to the infrastructure yeah so you know we'll focus a lot on uh like infrastructure tooling it's just probably like our strongest thing in teleport 9 but in 9.1 we extend the same short-lived certificates for database access um kubernetes and applications and as you may know, in um, our current configuration of Teleport for Kubernetes, you actually have to issue a very long join token because the it doesn't persist the connection. So we plan to use machine ID to issue the kube configs and always keep your kube config and the connection between like Teleport and your Kubernetes cluster always updated and secure. All right. Awesome. Oh, we, we just got a question from Avinash, who's just joined and is curious if the concept of machine ID has been explained yet. So we're, we're talking about it right now, Avinash. Uh, so I'll paraphrase it and Ben can correct anything that I got wrong. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> I wouldn't make you explain it twice unless I've just completely fluffed it and misunderstood anyway. But, you know, the what Teleport has done really, really well today is when humans want access to infrastructure, because let's face it, humans are the security problem anyway, um, they, they go through teleport and authenticate as a human, and then you get federated access to servers and databases. The challenge there has been that if you want to give Jenkins, GitHub Actions, or any automation access to any of these resources, which are being uh, commoditized, I don't even know if that's the right word, commoditized or secured via teleport, um, people would have to do some weird things there. Now, in the past, I've just used local users and breaking out of that entire control flow and saying this works, um, which is usually bad practice. Ben mentioned that there's also impersonation and teleport, but that is then using user authentications to pretend to be another role within a teleport ecosystem, which works well. But this new concept, machine ID, allows machines and automation processes to become first-class citizens within the teleport authentication workflow and give them access to the same resources in a secure fashion. Does that work? I think that's a great <laughs> summary. Awesome. I was really terrified I was going to make an arse of that, um, but we're good. So do you want to tell us a little bit about, I'm curious of how machine ID works from 
um, thinning up and getting started. And I, I, we will have demos, but maybe we could talk about it at a high level. How does it work into the flow that we have now? And uh, how does it work under the covers if we're willing to kind of go into a little bit of detail there as well? Yeah, so at a high level, um, you know, I think, where do, where do I begin for the high level? So <laughs> we have um, a T-Bot service. And so when you install Teleport, now there's like a fourth binary called T-Bot. And T-Bot is the service that you will issue on, let's say, your Ansible control node. And you sort of enroll T-Bot in the same way in which you'd enroll Teleport nodes, either through like an ephemeral join token or our IAM token join method. I would actually recommend, or well, we've like focused most of our sort of UX around the AWS token join method, which means you don't need to share any secrets. Um, you just give it a, basically, as long as the machine has the a role identity, it can automatically join the cluster. And then you scope your access in the same way in which you'd use teleport roles. So you just use another role and the role says, you can access these, like this machine can access these hosts, say like Jenkins, hyphen star and it can do the like these commands okay. and then if you're in your application for um it has some like handy other features so for ssh configs it like automatically creates an ssh config for you so i'll do an ansible example and you'll see it just more or less works sort of out of the box you don't need to make any of the other changes and let's say if you're uh, like when we add database support you'll just sort of change your set up to use the three certificates for TLS connections, as opposed to, let's say, like the password for your Postgres database. Okay. So I didn't know that it hooked into, so that's just, you can use AWS kind of workload identity to be able to speak to teleport. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think we added it in like seven, but there's an IAM join method. And so you just give, you create a token that says this token can join with this role. And as long as it has the identity document from this account, you can automatically join the account. And does this, uh, does this change anything for the operator side of teleport? Do, they, do I need to do anything different when deploying teleport? Or is this just something that I get out of the box by default for free with any teleport, uh, like an app upgrade or an app install? Up, yeah, I mean. you just get it for free. You might have to change like the token type, um, but as long as you're in um, Amazon. So like what people were doing is like, let's say it's like the bootstrapping your trust problem. And so Teleport has like a range of different tokens. So I think at the sort of least secure, you could just do like a hard coded string, which is probably our least secure version. Then you can do a issue like tcuddle, like nodes join or cube join. And then that's like a short-lived join token. And some people would publish those tokens to like uh, secret store. And then when you bootstrap the host, it would like go to secret store, download the join token, and then it would join. In this way, you don't need to do any of that other kind of like machinery. You can just use the IAM join method for your nodes, for example, or for T-Bot in this case. Okay. What about for people that are not on AWS? Is this something that you think will be rolled out to like Google's version of workload identity or Azure's or what about people on bare metal? Do they have any options to be able to hook into this machine ID concept? Um, we'll probably look at into the other cloud providers, you know, uh, GCP and Azure have the same like identity documents available on the hosts, but for bare metal, you sort of have to build your own trust of what the <laughs> machines are. That doesn't sound scary at all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess in theory, you know, that like the pro like historically, like you go to the rack, you see that machine, you'd be like, okay, I trust this machine, but in the cloud, you don't know necessarily that that new machine that fired up is like your machine or not. Yeah, that makes sense. And there's like another interesting project, like uh, SOPS was a project from Mozilla yeah. for encrypting your like ENV and they use the same sort of, uh, method for encrypting their tokens using a sort of a KMS key based upon like the identity documents. Okay, cool. But this is like a whole rabbit hole of, I actually have a webinar on like called tokens, TLS and teleport, <laughs> which is sort of deep dive into all of the different ways in which you can set up or configure tokens. Um, and it's a fun topic, but it's, it's also like quite day two operations. Um, but day two happens to be all the other days after you set up teleport. So it is important. 
Okay. What are some of the the primary use cases then for people to start rolling out or using machine ID? I think infrastructure tooling. Um, I have a good demo for Ansible and then also for Jenkins. Just these tools that you've had around in which you've had to provide them SSH certificates or access for a period of time, but you haven't rotate, like you, you might've created a public private key and you haven't really rotated it that often. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've seen more supply chain attacks that have gone through CI, CD build servers. And I think it's sort of that area in which people are paying more attention to. So that's probably where we would start. I think the next one will be adding support for databases and sort of applications and Kubernetes clusters. But um, that support is in 9.1. All right, awesome. Another use case is if you want to interact with the Teleport API, you can use Tbot to get a certificate that will talk to the Teleport API as well. Okay, so, I mean, I don't know what your Ansible demo is, but let me guess, <laughs> uh, and then you can, you can walk us through it. So when I think of Ansible, I think about a, a human typically running an Ansible playbook, which has an inventory file, but allows it to go and speak to one or more machines. I'm assuming your demo is going to be, well, what if I want to automate running an Ansible playbook and have the machine do that without the human component there? I'm assuming Ansible is going to request some sort of ephemeral SSH token to go onto all the machines or run the playbook? Or is that just way off the mark? It's pretty close. I think the thing that is different <laughs> is it's more or less the same. And Teleport or like Machine ID does everything for you. So you don't need to worry about... Um, certificates and access, the SSH config actually generates it all for you. Um, so maybe just a demo would be the easiest way to kind of like show you. Yeah, let's take a look. Sounds good. Okay. Um, share my screen. All right, your screen is now shared. Okay. I can see a terminal so and I can see GitHub login for Teleport. Yeah, we have this sort of diagram, which I kind of come back to it. Um, but this is sort of what I'll walk through. So we have Teleport uh, deployed. We have an Ansible control node, and we have a group of sort of EC2 servers that we've added that it can um, connect to. And like I said, this machine ID is joined using the IAM join method. And they actually, these credentials for the SSH config are rotated every 20 minutes. Oh, nice. um, which is sort of a cool feature that sort of happens out of the box. And there's other security features like you can lock hosts, um, SSO in. So much <laughs> multi factor. Yep, every time. Oh, and my password. I have a blog post called why SSO sucks and you can see why this is my <laughs> daily experience. Okay. So, you know, here's teleport, you know, people who are familiar, this is like a list of all of the servers and hosts. You don't necessarily have to like this machine ID service has like teleport and machine ID just for this sort of demo purposes, uh, to make it easy to access. And. I have a Ansible playbook. So let's just, so the, uh, my playbook, very simple. It just, all hosts, the Ubuntu user, it just pings host name. So, yeah. um, let me just run it. Oh no. <laughs> okay. So some of these ones haven't connected. And actually there's a reason for this is, this is because my host file it means like it's probably this host has been cycled through yeah, and I no longer have access to this host, but these other ones are running. And as you become into, uh, active sessions, you can see it's sort of like all these sessions are firing up. It's sort of going and in our audit log, you can see that we have command execution from my Ansible bot. Uh, I think it was also what's kind of interesting is you see a uh, like an SCP upload of like how it sort of Ansible sort of works behind the scenes. And so I guess 
this is sort of the auditing aspect of machine ID, but you see it more or less work, but until I guess I didn't work for these ones for yeah. Archibald. And so for there you go. Me, my Ansible config. See, my Ansible config is pretty standard. Um, I, the host key is on. I have an inventory of host on my .host file. SSH connection is true. And then my arguments is I pick the information from this machine ID SSH config. And we have this command that will like populate this for you. So if I. Uh, you can see I have, you know, this is sort of my SS, like, this looks very familiar for people who have a, like, dot .ssh. Yeah. And in, inside of here, we have sort of the the key, the SSH certificates, the SSH cert. Um, and then we also create this SSH config for you. And this SSH config sort of does the plumbing to know, like, okay, under the hood, it's connecting to these hosts with these identity files. It's running these commands. It's going over port uh, 3023. Um, and you don't need to edit this at all. So that's the SSH config. Let me just show you the hosts file. And then you see my host is just a list of all of my nodes which are the same nodes here based upon host name plus the cluster name of my cluster, which is teleport nine. And I think some of these were disconnected. That's why the host name wasn't able to connect, but that's sort of the configuration and sort of setup. I'll just kind of like pause there for. Yeah. I want to make sure I, thoughts. <laughs> I understand what's happening here. Right. So this. This is a AWS EC2 virtual machine just running some Linux operating system. Is there yeah. a teleport agent running on this machine? There is a teleport agent, which, you know, I'm in a teleport session, but there is also a, um, a keybot service. Right. Okay. And so this is sort of very familiar for people who are used to sort of teleport. You know, we have a like T-bot start. We have a config that I can show you. It's using the IEM join method. And then you can see the renewal interval is every uh, 20 minutes. And so in the background, this is connecting and talking to teleport. And each 20 minutes, it just issues new certificates, um, which in the background, AMPS will use. OK. If this T-Bot service is offline for more than 20 minutes, will it fail to rejoin? Is that what the certificate rotation means? Yeah. Right. Okay. So as long as it's online and happy, it's going to continue to rotate its there. Then there was the, so as I was using an SSH config. So what's the command that I need to run to be able to generate that for? There is, uh, let's go to our docs. <laughs> um, So there is tbot init, and init has some yeah, also useful commands for like ACLs and writing permissions for which uses the owner and when to initiate it. So um, I think we have examples here with file permissions or with ACLs. Um, let's say for the Jenkins example, uh, if you're running it as like a root user, but you can also want to make it to the owner Jenkins Jenkins. We have these instructions here, and that will sort of configure your files correctly. And then once you run tbot uh, t start, this will just go about and you know configure everything for you. I think the one other addition, which actually is probably missing here, is it's based upon your uh, tbot config. And currently, this kind, so configs is SSH client. You can get TLS certificates. And as we add databases and other additions, you can just sort of edit um, the YAML file to get those other certificates for you. Right. Okay. <laughs> I 
I think I understand that. So I'm thinking about um, if I were setting this up for myself, I spin up an EC2 instance, I install teleport. What does the uh, teleport, does teabot need configured? Besides the uh, I am stuff that we put, does, like, does it need a join token? Does it need a certificate? Yes, it needs, uh, okay, so we have, the first thing you need to do is add a, like a user. And so this is like token based. The IAM method, you create like a new token. And this is kind of what I was saying. You restrict it to a AWS on for access and give it a name. And then when you enroll the token, you sort of do tbots add. And then that's sort of the same flow as uh, tcuddle uh, teleport sort of add a node. And then it's the same flow of starting machine ID. And uh, yeah, then there's like other sort of debug commands here for uh, making sure that you have access. Cool. Awesome. I like that. Um, is there anything else for Tbot? And I think kind of, well, let's just run my... We have the... Let's run the on the playbook again. And actually, so you noticed in my current demo, I just have hard coded host file. And we have instructions here on sort of how to generate the host file in our Ansible guide. In this case, we use like TSH to list. And then we just add this to a host file. This would be something in which like we'll likely make a small program that will just talk to the teleport API to generate this host file for you. But this is sort of just an example. And this is why the host file was sort of out of date of teleport because I've, you know, been firing up my cluster um, up and down. So this yeah, would be like another area in which you might want to automate. The Tbot daemon could just like load an eBPF program to do this dynamically rather than actually modifying the host file. I think that would be pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, then that's also like the same inventory of uh, teleport, you know, you'd want to also like, you know, create different, like use our labels based for RBAC. And actually, if you come to RBAC, um, they do create these like automatically generated roles, which sort of show you like, what labels you can get access to which role, like under the hood, like which roles does it impersonate? Yeah. And what resources does it have access to? And so it has access to the certificate authority, but it can't read any secrets. And there has been lots of work done around like the security of um, these certificates and tokens. And I think that's sort of one core focus that we work with our customers is just the, if someone wants to get access to a certificate, one, you like, you have the ability to lock these um, bots pretty easily. You can make rotation easier and there's sort of some other stuff behind the scenes we've done to really sort of secure it so definitely it's relatively easy for ansible but i think the most value comes from people who are very sort of conscious and concerned of these different sort of robots and ants like ansible can like touch all of your systems and yeah if someone gets access to those like public private keys you could be in some trouble yeah, definitely. Um, like, I mean, I've lost count of the amount of times in my career that I've generated that, you know, SSH key gen. And then that just, that's just been a key I've used forever for the lifetime of a project to do any automation whatsoever. And uh, yeah, you... so we also have like the audit log of uh, the certificates issued. And I think we sort of ran through, um, like, we've executed a command, like, um, what happened during these sort of sessions. Um, it's just sort of useful telemetry that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise get of because all the connections go through teleport. Yeah, and that's super important because we get all of that auditing stuff that we, we just need for all of these processes. Like if we ever uh, want to understand if a bot has gone a bit rogue on us for whatever reason, then we have all that information in the teleport audit log. But I think that's a, a really exciting addition and I think it's going to be really important. And I, I'm going to just say like the... The TLDR for the people watching is that if you have any automation that needs access to a server or a database, then machine ID is probably the way that you want to start building out that automation um, in the future. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's kind of like a primitive. You can build upon it based upon how you want to configure um, your services. You know, you could 
run Tbot on the machine, or you could like publish certificates and pull them through a secret manager if you wanted to. Um, you have a range of options. Does that mean I can have all of my Kubernetes components authenticate via automatically self-rotating every 20 minutes X509 certificates? Is that something that you see, maybe not today if it's not possible, or in the future? Yeah, I think that will be coming um, in, I think, Teleport 9.1. Uh, I think the first today is just SSH, but we'll be adding uh, database and Kubernetes support. Awesome. Very, very cool. All right. Anything else on machine ID that you want to? Um, I think that's it. I think the blog post goes into detail. Also, if you're interested, check out our documentation. Um, Jenkins is another tool. We have an example here of using Jenkins for your Jenkins workers, which is another, another example um, of a service that you might have around, which you haven't necessarily considered of hardening how you do deal with like SSH. Um, and once you sort of configure and set it up, you know, this is an example in the Jenkins pipeline. You can, you know, if there is something in your pipeline, you can just use Teleport um, for it. Great. Yeah, I'm going to have to play with that. I mean, I don't use Jenkins as much as I, I used to, that's for sure. But uh, so, you're a lucky man. <laughs> yeah, I don't think everybody has that privilege. So uh, there's a bit of a mechanical buzz there can you if you've got like a cable for your mic or something just pull it out and push it back in or okay is it still there <laughs> all right i think we're good is it still there oh yeah it's still buzzing <laughs> okay. All right, how is that? You've angered it. <laughs> I made it worse? <laughs> oh, no. Hold on. <laughs> okay, is that any better? Much better. That is clean. We're good. Okay, perfect. Okay, uh, should we move on to the next features? Are there any questions? Yeah, uh, if you are watching and you've got, uh, yeah, I'll pop us back over to face mode. Hold on. If you're watching and you're curious um, or have any questions about Machine ID, drop them into the comments and Ben and I will tackle them. Um, but there is a lot more in Teleport 9 that we can take a look at. So, uh, what do you want to tackle next? I did have a list. Um, okay, we've let's talk about Redis. All right. I know you've been dying to talk about Redis, so let's talk about Redis. <laughs> I mean, Salvatore is no longer working on Redis, which I'm very sad about, but many small Redis comps with Salvatore was always, um, always fun. Uh, do you want to share my screen again? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's go. So, when we are talking about Redis and Teleport 9, I'm assuming Redis has now been added as a supported database so that people can use the Teleport proxy to connect and secure that access to it. Correct. Yep. Awesome. So, Redis is like one of those interesting products. Um, and I actually like hosted a Redis conf years ago and Salvatore was always like, you know, he's quite an opinionated programmer, but he's like, you shouldn't really put Redis on the internet. It wasn't designed for that. <laughs> and meaning that, you know, like Redis should really be in its own like private subnet. you like, you don't necessarily want to like publicly expose um, Redis, which, um, you know, I guess eventually people will do things with your tool that you may not necessarily expect. Oh, and so you have like basic, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, password or, but in Redis 6, they added support for uh, TLS certificates for authentication. And just in general, like database support on Teleport, you know, they're always like kind of like where your crown jewels are, but also is most likely to be passing around a shared password, maybe for a team or a group. And it runs into that same traditional problem of if a team member leaves, like, did you rotate the password? Like, 
probably not. It's like that one ops person who seeded the first RDS database, like there's still a password likely on like his notepad somewhere okay. that will get root access. And, um, you know, teleport, you know, we started with the large like SQL and NoSQL databases. Um, and then we're just sort of expanding our suite of tools. So in teleport nine, we added Redis, MariaDB, which is, you know, like a MySQL variant and Microsoft, uh, SQL server, um, which I haven't configured in this one because I didn't want to necessarily go through the pain of configuring <laughs> Microsoft SQL server. All right. So you didn't and, just add one database to teleport nine. You've added Redis, Microsoft SQL yeah. server and MariaDB. Yep. But that's cool. I know and a lot of people that prefer MariaDB to MySQL um, ever since Oracle had their acquisition. Um, so it's good that the, the people that did go down that route can also take advantage of these tools. And I, I yeah, guess so some people our... like MicroSQL Server. I've never used it. I have no, I couldn't tell you a single damn thing about Microsoft SQL Server, but it's cool that people can secure it. All I knew was when I looked at our docs, it required going to like the UI. Or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, if, if I have to hook up Active Directory to speak to my database, I am already broken. This is not going to happen. Oh, yeah. When this popped <laughs> up, I was like, oh, I don't know if this is for me. <laughs> but it is, we do have people. Um, and I'll probably configure this at some point when I when I get the time for it. But these are all of our databases. You know, we support, um, and we're just sort of slowly expanding them. Um, the team is cranking like crazy. So if there's any one that you have a particular interest in, you know, you can ping me. I know we've already had requests for Redis, uh, like the AWS version of Elasticash, which is in process as well. And then also just a note on Redis, there's like two different instructions for if you're using Redis cluster or um, standalone Redis, um, the instructions don't differ too much. Um, but once connected, you'll get a sort of like a list of your databases and everything for connecting and accessing your database is actually done on the terminal. You know, we have some instructions here to sort of, uh, to tell you how to like log in, get, get credentials, but we assume most database people have their own tooling either, you know, it's like the Redis CLI or it is like, um, GUIs for Postgres. And we also have instructions on how to configure those GUIs. So let's log in. And then I'm using my SSH flow again. I didn't have to log in again. That's good. <laughs> well, I think you're okay. Maybe. Uh, I think it's okay. There we are. So we're in. And you know, you know, same sort of flow. Like for servers, we have TSHLS, TSHDBLS. Um, One thing that you do need to do is you need to log in with the database user. And this is almost like your principle in the world of servers. So if you would log in as like Ubuntu, it needs to be sort of baked into your certificate. You do the same thing for logging into um, the database. So I have a, I actually think this user's different. I think it's SRE team is my, save my user. And then I can just do TSH DB connect uh, Redis. And what's really interesting here, so this is connected, but if I do like ping, not authenticated, Redis does require you to also add a password auth in addition to the TLS certificates, just the way in which it works. I don't know that. Ping. Most of the ones, like there's always like a little quirk, um, Let's say you're configure so you have access to the database, but you also need to map the user and the database together. And so for people who are used to like the Kubernetes and server flow, just be aware of that extra mapping of a database user. It normally differs per database, um, just to sort of put in your um documentation. Cool. Um, Can I ask you the hard question then? Yeah. <laughs> so with the introduction of machine ID. And 
uh, teleport now is supported more and more databases. I'm starting to have this really weird idea that even in my application code, instead of configuring it to speak directly to my database with a username and password or, you know, forever certificates that I'm never going to rotate because I'm a terrible SRE, does teleport fit into that workflow or would that just be really silly? And by that, I no, mean, that if definitely... my backend application used teleport and machine ID for every connection, every request, is that a good thing? Should I be, should I be experimenting with that? We like that is, if you look at the demo video for machine ID, that's sort of what we, what we led with is talking like a microservice talking to your infrastructure. Now, I guess the question is, is it a good thing? We believe so, especially for, let's say, your um, development or like, let's say you will need to do some local development against a staging database. It's like a perfect use case. For your production DB, I'm not 100% sure on like our performance, you know, if everything has to go through teleport, what's the performance overhead? I asked the team, they said it's kind of like minimal <laughs> because once it's sort of connected, it kind of goes through, but it is like another uh, something else in the middle. But I guess teleport is not handling connection pulling or anything like that. I'm assuming that every request is, is spun up, accepted, responded, and then shut back down. Um, I'm not 100% sure on the connection pooling and the performance overhead, but we can, I think this is an area that we'll like keep exploring. And this is definitely an area in which we want to like get, you know, we want to sort of remove all passwords yep. and passwords. We also see as like API keys um, for your databases or um, whatever sort of secrets you have. Yeah. And so you, Sorry. um, <laughs> You can do it for like your microservice. So instead of adding it, um, instead of using like hard coding a Postgres or like Redis database, you just use the certificates that you obtain and then you can sort of go about your connections and one, you know, like who's accessing which database and you have the full sort of audit log. Yeah. I've kind of got this grand vision now that, uh, in my Kubernetes cluster is that every single backend service that needs to speak to any other service could just have a sidecar teleport thing that does the machine ID uh, and then works out if I'm allowed to speak to Postgres or I'm allowed to speak to Kafka or I'm allowed to speak to Redis. And it just like, to the point where I'd almost have like zero configuration anymore to speak to a database. And I think that would be pretty cool. Yeah. And if, if it um... seems like what you're showing me is, kind of where it's heading and i think that's really exciting yep it's definitely um where we're heading um and hopefully we'll have more demos over the next coming months maybe this is a good uh, follow-up <laughs> live stream yeah that seems like one of those questions to you're like uh that's on our roadmap and i can't really talk about that yet so just shut up david uh no it is, on. Our, <laughs> it is in our video um oh, but i don't have that? a working uh, example no yet, no I, sorry or... i don't need to see i just uh, i think <laughs> You know, especially if, you know, I know that the workload identity works with AWS, but I'm like, could they pick up the service account and verify that? And then they know the pod with the, like the, the downward API, like all of this could be baked into some sort of agent. And then all of my, all of my requests to other databases and even other services to another point could be handled in this kind of secure audited fashion. Um, I've, basically what I'm saying is teleport next product has to be a service mesh. I think that's where you're going now. So we need, we need, we need T-Mesh. Can we get T-Mesh? We actually <laughs> talk about why uh, Machine ID isn't a service mesh in our blog post. Oh, um, I need to start paying more attention. <laughs> let me see, go here. And what do we say? We have a full, so we talk about like PKI and Machine ID, and then we'll talk about service meshes. Oh, yeah. So like how we kind of like fit in. This is like the official word. Um, uh, I think our answers are still a bit vague. So we say we're complementary. We sort of work together with the service meshes. Um, but like all these tools, you know, it's always like building on top of other tools um, and adding on top of it. Oh well, yeah. Well, and actually, if you look of... at like, sorry, you go ahead. Oh, if you look at like uh, 
Kong or Itzio or Envoy, like they have like some basic certificate authority kind of like baked into them, but you can provide your own certificates. And so maybe this is sort of a avenue, at least for the like CA management and RBAC is sort of how we support the sort of service mesh solutions. Well, yeah, I, I was kind of about to touch on that as well. Like all of these things pretty much, I think nine times out of 10, they run their own in cluster CA as they handle automatic MTLS across services. Um, but I think they only work mostly for HTTP traffic. I don't think it works with the, the kind of database level layer, or at least it doesn't have that, uh, I guess it's L7 awareness. I can't try to remember my OSI layers, but I think L7 is application there, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, it would be cool. Yeah, I could see a future, I guess, where Cilium and SDO, uh, Linkerd, etc., maybe start to rely on teleport as a, a CA and be able to pass those around, baking in more le level seven awareness and application handling. But like, oh, you know, this pod is now trying to speak to Postgres. We're going to uh, give it the right certificate to go and authenticate against that. I don't know. This is just grand ideas. I've, I'm, it just makes me excited to see what Teleport does in the next six months and the next two releases because I'm pretty sure you've got a lot in your heads and a lot of people with great ideas too. So. Yeah, definitely. We'll be exploring uh, more avenues. So like, let me just close the loop on Redis. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. We were doing a Redis demo. <laughs> and carried, then you can see we have... Oh, you can see I typed Redis info wrong. You can say like who executed which query and which database. And I think this is just like the core, you know, teleport spreading but it's like you have these shared logins for accessing services, it's the SRE team, and you know it's like tied to my identity uh, as Ben Aaron accessing this host, doing whatever like debugging commands, um, which is that easy sort of compliance check. Cool. All right. What is next on my list? Okay, so another one that's pretty exciting, but I tried it before this and it didn't work. <laughs> so we, <laughs> is our access requests and we can try it now. But I had this blog post today, which is why the four eyes principle is critical for access. It's a bit of a long ramble about um, basically how like the majority of our teleport has gone from it's there's different technology solutions. So we have like our session recording, but there's ways around our session recording because there's problems with restricted shells. And so we talked about why we created enhanced EBPF session, enhanced session recording, which is great, but it also doesn't necessarily stop everything. So like, you can't really, like you can turn off SCP, but there's still ways in which you can like exfiltrate data. And we, there's another good blog post here about restricted shells. And the long winded, conclusion is like ultimately you sort of need more individuals and humans to be on a session to either moderate it or see what's happening she um coinbase back in the day I, I guess they don't do this now they don't now they're globally remote but they had like a ssh room with a drop cam in which coinbase would do all of their ssh activity and that was the only way in which you get access to certain hosts and and to some degree you know with our shared sessions, which I guess you use for your, um, clustered, you, anyone can kind of join them or there's like some limited, but you can now set like back to require certain roles to join a session for them to join. So there's an mm -hmm. example Kubernetes role here in which you need to be a SecOps role and an audit role to join a session. Um, and I can try the demo gods <laughs> here. Um, I was in this least it was my demo user. Also a great program programmer at Teleport. Um, log in. And then this is, you know, like the standard flow for getting <coughs> cube configs. I have a, okay, so they should, I think I just filed a bug this morning. Like there should be a message here saying like this session is sort of hanging right now. And if I come to the audit log, you can see that Lisa has made a request to access a Kubernetes cluster for like a kubectl exec and is waiting for someone to approve it. 
And until someone else joins this session, it will just sort of hang. And that other party or multiple parties have the ability to also terminate the session as well. And this is sort of our Kubernetes moderated sessions. Cool. But I, it's a bit difficult to demo because I also need to hack up another user. You have user to have a second login. Join. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and I think I can't like exit this either. I think there's like another bug. So <laughs> more the bugs should be gone for um, moderated sessions. Awesome. Yeah, that would be a cool feature as well. Um, Avinash, while you're on the audit page, Avinash asked, what is the EI field in the audit log? I didn't the see an EI. EI field, but maybe, you know. Um, I actually don't know what the EI field is. That's a great question. I think it's always zero. <laughs> I can get back to you. Yeah, always zero. Well, keen eye, Avinash. Unfortunately, we don't know. Uh, well, we'll, I don't know. We'll, we'll work it out and think... we'll leave a comment on a video and we'll tweet something about it. Too. But yeah, I'm curious about that. All right, then last up. Wait, there's more? Is there's more as always more Dave. you should know it's fun <laughs> apparently it for was the... seven for redis just throwing that out there so ei for redis was seven uh, for redis hmm it's all right me... you, you carry over your demo and, uh, uh, i can check that though so one of the other additions which actually i think is pretty cool we didn't really talk about this much me edit my role um is we added quite MFA. So we added this feature that lets you add other, so let me just check that this, this is right. I could just, <laughs> uh, I just go over it see what happens. I think it doesn't, <clears throat> okay. Require MFA is not right. Okay. So, um, added sort of per session MFA. And you can set up uh, require MFA sessions. And so each time you start a session, you are required to present a hardware token or a software token. And we added this support for our uh, Windows access and <clears throat> what does it require? Okay, require session MFA. And so this lets you add an additional second factor. So in my account settings, I have a YubiKey and you can add multiple hardware tokens. Yeah. And this sort of prevents, like, let's say someone gets access to your GitHub account. If you acquire MFA, you know, they would also need access to like a hardware token in addition to whatever to get access. Yep. Um, but I think I need to log out back in again. Useful for production databases, I would imagine. Yes. And there's actually one open issue that we're making like per like it's currently per role and we'll plan to make like per label to just give you a bit more flexibility oh, nice. but we added this so let's say if i come into this domain controller okay well now the clipboard and it's going to ask me to verify my identity which means i need to tap my um token and it logs me into my uh domain controller you can see the clipboard sharing's enabled it's recording um, I don't know if you spend much time in uh, main controllers. <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> but <laughs> you try not to. But um, you know, this was like desktop access was adding in Teleport uh, eight, but we sort of rounded it out so the recording is a big addition along with our um, clipboard. So let me just close this. Let me just disconnect. And now we have the same session recording and playback for um, desktop sessions as well. Very cool. So you can know what's happening, which is pretty interesting. Like the most basic level of RDP is like a tile of PNGs. And I actually have another like live stream with the developer. This is pretty interesting sort of background, like we built it from scratch, our sort of RDP protocol support. Um, and so for people who are interested, especially in like, we built it with Rust, it's like an interesting sort of tech deep dive as well as sort of interesting tech problems with uh, adding desktop support. 60 PNGs per second just being saved. Is that what it is? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's like, like 
tiled. Um, and it, you actually, you can't stop and play it due to like the stream of PNGs. We're also looking at like different video formats. So we're sort of get, trying to get feedback about where we should have take this session player next. Um, but for people who are sort of upgrading their like Windows desktop access, um, lots of exciting sort of updates and improvements for them. Sweet. Awesome. Well, I'm glad I'm right. working on session recording for desktop sessions and other people get to do that because uh so while you were also saying that i looked up the ei thing are you curious i'm curious yeah it's event index so the zero is every time you open a new session and then every subsequent command ei will be incremented by one so that you have an order for the commands executed which is why oh. redis was seven because you did the ping pong seven failure commands. and then you did an off and then you did a redis info and so forth that's it. Easy when All you right, know. that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good idea. Event index. So I know there's a lot here in this version. Um, if anyone has any questions for like machine ID or they want to try it out, um, I know I'll be hitting you up, David, for when we add our database support, sort of Kubernetes services will be an exciting area for exploration. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's something I'm going to have to. I'm going to start playing with machine ID now and, and see how I can incorporate it into my my production infrastructure. I have a lot of automation that works, so uh, and I am very bad for long lived hard coded tokens. So I'm going to see if I can uh, remove a lot of this from my workflow. So I'll definitely. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm sure I'm going to be in touch on Slack. Like, help. Ben, yeah, if I anyone wants to join, <laughs> here's our link to our Slack room. Um, and yeah, we'll. It's sort of growing and we're always sort of happy to help. And then if there's any bugs, you know, we're like an open core, open source company, you can sort of come in here and um, sort of see what's happening. And then the last thing is we talked about like roadmap and supports. We have our upcoming releases page sort of describes, um, you know, Kubernetes and database access support for machine ID. We have a teleport terminal, which is going to be an exciting addition in 9.2. More to come on that. What's the teleport terminal? Uh, my interest is peaked. That's, tell me, tell me, tell me. That's one for another webinar. I'll keep that for a different session. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can see we're also having Cassandra and Snowflake support um, and going GA. So lots of stuff sort of happening here. Um, so yeah, just we're sort of available and here to chat. All right. Well, we'll give everybody a couple of minutes. If you have any questions, I'll drop them into the comments now. I see we've got one from you, Evan Ash, so we'll tackle that first. Uh, but if anyone else has any questions, let us know and we'll tackle that. Uh, Evan Ash asks, does Teleport provide access controls to streaming services like RabbitMQ as well? So are, do you plan on supporting Rabbit, uh, Kafka, Red Panda, anything like that? Um, I'm not too sure, actually. I I'll have to talk to Roman. I kind of forget what the auth protocol is for Rabbit and Kafka. It's been a while <laughs> since I've been on the sharp end of it. Uh, I think Kafka by default is nothing, <laughs> but you can configure it for X509. So this it might work well. Rabbit MQ, okay. I'm not that familiar with anymore. I haven't touched it in, in many years. Um, so I'm not sure what the authentication is like there. Yeah, it's definitely something that we could look into. Uh, like open a GitHub issue and we can sort of dive into it. I guess the idea being if it's X509, then Teleport can support it. And it's just a matter of how many people want it and upvoting all these issues, right? Yeah, pretty much. All right. So Avanash, go check for RabbitMQ or Kafka issue, whatever one you're looking for. Uh, if it's not there, start it. Thank you for your question. <sighs> oh, well, well, we'll give everyone just one more minute. How's your how's your day going, Ben? Is it morning or evening for you? It's the morning here, just getting started. It's the accent that throws me off. I'm always like, he's right next yeah. to me, but he's not. So. <laughs> I know. Just getting started. But I've done my blog post for the day. I've done my live stream, so I might take a little break, which is important to it's step away from your computer. Always. Well, not for me. I'm looking outside. And it's absolutely heaving down a rain. So I might just end up staying in my office and not leaving, but we'll see. Oh. It's going to be 24 degrees today out here. So, where are you again? <laughs> I'm in Oakland. Oakland. 
there we go. Uh, yeah. yeah, you're always going to get the good weather over there, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Do you ever miss the British weather? No, I don't miss no. the British weather. <laughs> <laughs> all right i don't uh, think but, um, oh by the way i think last thing are you going to KubeCon? i am going to KubeCon. are you going to KubeCon? i won't be going to KubeCon, but we'll have a big team there so if the last six people on the stream will be going to KubeCon, i know you have some exciting t-shirts too and uh we will have lots of swag so definitely swing by the booth for a chat or a demo with some of our team Awesome. Well, maybe I'll see you at KubeCon. It's Detroit in North America, right? At, at, in October. Yeah, I think I'll likely be in Detroit. Cool. Sweet. All right. Well, Ben, thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure. I'm looking forward to doing more experiments and demos with you, especially uh, as we roll out more teleport features. And I, I'm definitely going to hit you up for teleport terminal and see what that is. Plus the fun yeah, things awesome. to play with. But uh, thank Thanks, you again. David. Have a great day and I'll speak to you soon.